It's a great, very great pleasure for me as president of the Overseas Press Club to present two charming visitors, Madam and Ambassador Tran Van Chuang, who are here to discuss with us their point of view. Madam Chuang. Ambassador Chuang. who are here to discuss with us the tragedy of Vietnam as they have lived it very personally in their own lives. Before coming to the, the presentation of the ambassador, I'd like to introduce uh, Joseph Futtinger, chairman of the Friends of Vietnam. <laughs> Joe Newman, the program chairman of the Overseas Press Club, who has arranged all these meetings, needs no introduction. And Leo Chern, also a very old and dear member, the executive director of the Research Institute of America, is another one who needs no introduction. <laughs> with, with no other prelude, I'd like to um, ask Ambassador Tran Van Chung to share with us his own profoundly felt point of view on the tragic problem of Vietnam. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you will hear my voice. It is particularly bad today. And <clears throat> I thank you for your hospitality and your attendance because I realize how much you are already saturated with news and comments, uh, comments about Vietnam. Uh, therefore, <clears throat> I shall limit myself uh, to clarify some questions in which some doubts have been raised. First, let me reassure you about the integrity of American and Western newsmen stationed in Saigon, in Vietnam. They are not, as it has been hinted, a bunch of frustrated newsmen <coughs> and whose judgment may, may have been obscured by anger and frustration. Indeed, the picture in Saigon is much darker than they can realize. And <clears throat> the truth of it is proven by the fact that the most serious warnings about the political situation in Vietnam have been sounded long ago, long before the Buddhist crisis, by people in the United States who know most about <coughs> Vietnam. For instance, Senator Mansfield. For instance, the American Friends of Vietnam or the scholars of Michigan State, State University. You probably know that Senator Mansfield is the member of Congress who has been considered for over 10 years as the most authoritative specialist of Vietnam. He sounded an alarm 
over a year ago, in June 1962, and he sounded that alarm in Michigan State University. Probably you know uh, that the Michigan State University has sent hundreds of uh, professors and teachers to help Vietnam to work with the administration of Vietnam closely for years. Therefore, they are not, they have not been in Vietnam for two or three weeks. No, they worked closely with the administration of Vietnam. They knew the achievements and also they knew what was wrong with the administration of Vietnam. And they too were very, very alarmed already two years ago. And the American friends of Vietnam, of which we have here the executive chairman, they have been most exposed to the prop propaganda of uh, the government of Vietnam. Each year, they presented the achievement or the claimed achievements of the government of Vietnam to the American public for years. And yet, about two years ago, I had, as ambassador, I had to warn my government that uh, most members of the executive committee of the American Friends of Vietnam felt that it was a matter of conscience for them no longer to support the policy of the, Ameri of the government of Vietnam. I myself, last year, after a visit to Vietnam in February 1962, I was so much concerned by the, by the political situation in Vietnam that in July 1962, I wrote to President Ngo Dinh Diem that there was no possibility of victory over the communists unless he allowed a total change of both the government and the regime of Vietnam. I think that no ambassador has, ambassadors have ever made such a proposal to his chief of state. That is to say, to step down, at least not as head of state, but step down himself as head of government and to allow a complete change of the government and of the regime. And I was not driven by personal ambition because when I made, him, made to him that proposal, I said, you should consult the wisest men in the country, and after that, appoint a prime minister who should not be neither one of your brothers nor myself, because I am your ally. My daughter has married your brother, and therefore, I feel that I should not be the head of the new government because the country no longer wants of that regime. And therefore, it is, would be much better to have a total change of the regime and of the government. This is only to give you an idea of the seriousness of that situation over a year ago. More than a year before Secretary McNamara and General Taylor said 
that the political situation in Vietnam indeed remains deeply serious. And now, this, this leads me to uh, say that the Buddhist crisis in Vietnam is only an effect, a result of that exceptionally bad, oppressive, and inefficient regime. It is not the beginning of bad things. No, it was only an effect. I know that the government of Saigon says it has been the, the internal troubles in Vietnam have been communist inspired. Well, you know that not one of the Buddhist monks who have made of themselves living torches just to let to tell the world how much they are oppressed. You know that not one of them has ever asked for anything communist or communist inspired. They have not asked for unification with North Vietnam. They have not asked, asked for peaceful coexistence. They have not asked for neutralism. And therefore, it is completely untrue that those dramatic, dramatic suicides have been inspired by, uh, by the communists. I would, uh, if I had time to do so, I would uh, give uh, I would read to you excerpts from a letter written to by a professor, a Vietnamese professor in Hue, to an American professor here in the United States. But I shall not read it because of lack of time and also because I do not want this speech to be too much emotional. My wife and I, indeed, we could not prevent tears from coming to our eyes when we read it. But I hope that you will find time and interest in reading the two pages of a diary of a professor of Hue. And then you will understand the revolt of the students of Vietnam, the revolts of their professors, the revolt, not only the Buddhists, but of the, right, the Catholic writer, of the Catholic writer, of, of the University of Hue. The government has said the, the killing, the stupid killing in Hue was caused by a plastic bombs. Well, I have here a copy of the legal medical report and photographs made available to me by my friend, Mr. Joseph Buttinger, the chairman of the American Friends of Vietnam. The legal medical report proves that at least the six children, among them four girls, had been beheaded. One of them lost his head, his neck, and one shoulder. 
And the spectacle of that wanton killing has so much revolted Professor Eric Wolf, a German nationality professor, who is not a Buddhist, that he came here to say what he, have see, he had seen in way. And therefore, the revolt, the manifestations, the demonstrations in Vietnam have been inspired indeed not so much by Buddhists, or, but it's, they have been inspired by indignation. And it is a deep revolt against the injustice and tyranny of a stupid government. I am, I am afraid that I must stop. But uh, here is also the a statement by Dr. Kaufman, and he stated that the photographs, the horrible photograph of these bodies has, has been taken by him, and it is the bodies of children that had been wantonly killed by government tanks in a way. He witnessed it, and the government was so un unscrupulous that the government said, no, it was the communists. And those horrible wounds had been caused by a communist bomb, plastic bomb. Unfortunately, not one witness in a way has ever seen anyone throw, throwing, throw any bomb into the crowd. Instead, Dr. Eric Wolf, who is not a Vietnamese, who is not a Buddhist, has seen and has reported that this stupid killing was the fact of uh, tank guns of the Vietnamese uh, of the, the Vietnamese government. I do not want to take more of your time, but I just want to warn you to say that the situation in Vietnam is indeed even more serious now than it was ten years ago. When the French had every reason to believe, every technical reason to believe that they were winning the war, but lost it only because they did not have the support of the Vietnamese people. And now I want you to know that the people of Vietnam is not only sullen as they were in 1953, they are revolted. They have enough of that regime, of this regime of fake independence. Of this regime, which has misused American aid to falsify everything in Vietnam and to perpetuate itself in power. Now, the best way to drive the Vietnamese people into the arms of the communists would be to give the Vietnamese people the impression that there is no alternative for them, to the press, no alternative for them uh, to the present regime in Vietnam, because it would be enough to drive them into the arms of the communists. This very morning, this very morning, you have read in the New York Times a dispatch from David Halberstam saying that 200 students have been reported to have defected 
to go with the coming. This is something that must, must be stopped and stopped right away. And I, ho I am sorry not to have more time, but now I am ready uh, to answer your questions. start our question and answer period, I would like to congratulate the ambassador on a, a very interesting position which he had taken during a brief chat that we had here during uh, luncheon just now. I had asked the ambassador how he felt about some of the criticism to which the directors of the Overseas Press Club had been exposed by members of the State Department and members of our own club as a result of the invitation that we had extended to his daughter to come here to speak. And I was delighted to hear the ambassador say that he felt that it was perfectly correct and proper that we should have given his daughter and anyone else who is a party to a dispute, national or international, to express his or her point of view quite freely. I think that's a magnificent position and one which might be very well recommended to those members of the State Department, to those members of the Overseas Press Club, and any others who have expressed themselves as they had against the invitation which we had extended to his daughter. May, may I add something? Of course, everyone should be heard. But let me tell you that I feel that uh, I have been a little discrimin discriminated against, <laughs> not by the Overseas Press Club, but uh, by, by, uh, by others. By others. <laughs> <laughs> In that connection, and this will, I think, perhaps uh, uh, conclude this little aside, uh, the ambassador, too, thought that uh, the person uh, who had profited by the greater exposure or the greater number of platforms which had been offered to her, uh, that person uh, did not necessarily gain by the additional publicity, he thought. And perhaps he might be right. <coughs> with that, we're ready to take uh, questions, starting first, as we always do, with the press table. What is your present itinerary? Where will you be going and speaking in this country during the next few weeks? I am afraid it will take too much time on my short time to say uh, this, but uh, I am afraid I am going to be quite busy uh, in the months ahead. Does the ambassador feel some personal torment, personal anguish, being in the position where he must criticize his own government? On the contrary, I feel it my duty to express the opinion, the feelings of my people in Vietnam. Since in Vietnam they cannot do it otherwise than by making of themselves living torches or by risking mass arrest and detention, as the students and the monks have experienced. And it is therefore my duty uh, to uh, speak for them. It is precisely for that purpose that I have resigned, because I want it, I think that it is my duty to speak for my people and not for the government, which is no longer, which, which does not represent my people.
how do you explain <clears throat> that uh, none of the press have been able to uh, pin down your daughter in the uh, alleged misrepresentations, uh, statements, positions that she has taken, quite contrary to the, the explanations which you have given here? <laughs> and then the second part of the question is, do you believe she is deliberately lying? I uh, have uh, for uh, I have refrained from uh, commenting everything Madame Mew has said. I do not want to enter a controversy with her. But uh, will you please uh, recall uh, what the question was? Well, uh, how do you explain that none of the correspondents uh, at the various places where she has spoken and gone have been able to pin her down on these uh, misrepresentations which she appears to have uh, made on, on these very points? <laughs> this is... The, it question, is the question of communism, the, the question of... Uh, Communism uh, inspiring the Buddhist liberations? Yes, but uh, I, uh, I cannot explain for them not to have do, uh, done so. I have given you the answer, and the answer is that it has not been communist inspired. When a man or a girl or a woman is ready, is willing to give his or her life to uh, proclaim something for a cause. He, all, he or she always takes, always says it. And if uh, they had been communist inspired, as I have just told you, they would, would have said, we want communism for Vietnam, or we want uh, peaceful coexistence, or we want uh, reunification with North Vietnam. This they have not. Therefore, it is not true that they have been communist inspired. This is what I, I, I can tell you, but I, I do not uh, know why the... the, the Oh, no, I, I shall not comment on, on this. <laughs> I, I, I know that not only Madame New, but President Ngo Ding Ziem and Archbishop Thuc uh, are completely cut off. Uh, they, they, they have lost the touch with reality. And that is why President Ziem himself said Oh, the, the monks who have Im immolated themselves? No, they have not killed themselves. They have been murdered. Uh, they, they have been murdered. And the archbishop, when he came here, he even added, not only they have, have they been murdered, they had, had been beaten with hammer. And the people uh, could uh, hear it uh, from outside, you see. I cannot explain this. They simply have eyes not to see, and you all, well, the whole world knows and has seen pictures of those Buddhist monks still praying amidst the flames. And those people have not hesitated to say that they had been drugged, that they had been murdered with the con con connivance of uh, Western TV, television. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yes, please do. Um, I'm Dorothy Almanski. I'm a student in public <coughs> education. I work for the government. But I was interested, Commissioner Ambassador, when you said that you thought that the present government should step down, yourself included. Now, possibly without naming names, are there people who would be in a position to step into the government and do that?
they have a chance of getting it. Are there people in a position to step into the government if the government steps down? There are certainly not one or two. There are hundreds of them. And uh, I may even say that when I had resigned, members of my staff have also resigned. And some of them, among them, a Catholic. And among them, there were pe people who had already lost, abandoned all they had in North Vietnam. And now, who have been, who ha, were willing to abandon safety for their families, a, an honorable job, just because they felt that they could no longer go along with a government which they said to me were, was worse than the communist. And therefore, I think that we have not to go too far in Africa or in France or uh, in Asia, in other parts of the country where very valuable Vietnamese have been forced into exile to look for someone more qualified than the present leaders of Vietnam to take over the government and to lead the Vietnamese people to victory. Here in the United States, in Washington, among the members of my staff, they all, I no, do not speak of myself, but the, the former minister counselor who resigned and accepted to be separated from his wife, who had, ha, has been forced to separate from him and to accept the, the job of teaching Vietnamese. Therefore, such men, they have a political background. They are more intellectually, morally, and politically more qualified than the present leaders of Vietnam to take over and to lead the Vietnamese people to victory, because at least they would be, they would not suppress the Vietnamese people. At least they would not use, misuse, the Ameri misuse American aid to stifle their people. And they would understand that the present war is a very difficult war, because the communists are supported by the communist world. They have a sanctuary. This is a difficult war which can only be won by the Vietnamese themselves. And only if they know that only that they have to be united, that, that they have to use all available anti-communist talents, at least I, I, I say there are hundreds of, of Vietnamese people who know this and who would be better qualified uh, to uh, be a government who, uh, which would no longer be the strongest asset of the communists and the greatest obstacle to victory as the present regime, the present government is. <laughs> yes, from the press table. To whom was the letter sent, the excerpts of which have been distributed here at this meeting? I, Mr. Batinger, I know also. I, uh, the, but, but uh, uh, no. I, I think I have, uh, it is Dr. Uh, Professor Wurfel, no? Uh, he, he gave it to me and saying that the professor, uh, it was addressed to an, uh, 
uh, to an American uh, professor. But uh, you know, yes, will you please say? If you allow me to comment on this. Uh, Would you like to come up here and then speak into the mic? Yeah. This, I'm afraid, is a very delicate matter, and I'm not sure it was wise to distribute these two pages. The letter was written by somebody who can easily be identified in Vietnam and who may, for the reason that he has written the letter, even if we don't divulge to whom he has written the letter, land in jail. So if it is being used, it should be used with discretion, and I'm sure the members of the press, many of whom have dealt with fascist and communist and other dictatorial regimes, know how to handle this. The letter was addressed to a former Vietnamese president, uh, the uh, professor at the University of Hue, who lives now in this country, and who was in a similar position at the university that was held later by the writer of this letter. The letter, without one's knowledge of the writer and the recipient, speaks so strongly for itself that no use should be made of either names or indications of who has sent it. Next question. Yes. How is it possible that the suicides which had taken place were not stopped by the authorities? When everybody knew about it. When it was known beforehand that they were going to take place and the cameramen and the newspaper men apparently were notified to be there in time. Uh, first, I have read in the newspaper uh, that the newsmen were not uh, notified of the suicide. They have, they have only someone telephoned to them uh, that something is going to appear on the market uh, place. That's all. And, uh, well, they come and they saw a Buddhist monk uh, stepping down from a tax taxi cab and immediately he knew that uh, a fire brigade, a special fire brigade in Saigon has been uh, set up uh, to prevent people from setting themselves afire. And therefore, the, the, this Buddhist monk, the sixth, the sixth uh, who has committed suicide that way, he stepped down the kaha and immediately he squatted on the pla uh, marketplace. He poured uh, gasoline on him and Stroke a match. This, is, this can be done in a few seconds, you see. Yeah, it, is, uh, it is not possible to, uh, the government wanted very much uh, to prevent such a suicide, but the government could not uh, uh, prevent it. What about the road? Huh? They, no. were, they were ropes set up to keep the people back. I have not heard of it. I, 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 I think that uh, I have heard, uh, I do not know. That may have been an exclusive story. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the press table? Uh, Mr. Buttinger. Yes, Mr. Buttinger. Mr. Ambassador, don't you think that the chief priest 
Why it was not possible to pin down Madame Lou. It was not her art of evasion and misrepresentation. But that the right questions were not asked. Let me therefore ask <laughs> Let me therefore ask one such question, <coughs> and I'm sorry I have to address it to you, but I'm sure you can answer it. Why did the foreign minister of your government, Uber Mark, who I think was in office this year, <coughs> resign? Did he resign because he was a hoodlum? a communist inspired or merely ill-informed like President Kennedy. Mr. Budinger asks, why did the foreign minister of the Vietnamese government resign? Was it because he was a hoodlum, communist inspired? I think we might mention the fact that he also was a Buddhist. Uh, was he not? Yes. Yes, he, uh, I think the, he, uh, Mr. Bettinger has answered his own question. And <laughs> I uh, only know that uh, the foreign secretary resigned after shaving his head in protest. I know also that before resigning that way, he took the precaution of uh, informing the ambassadors the diplomatic corps in Vietnam, so that the whole world knew, and it saved him. Because when he, after he, his resignation, after he had been so much applauded by the students, uh, he was very much uh, considered as a tr troublemaker. And uh, he w was allowed by the government to go in pilgrimage, in Buddhist pilgrimage in India. And the diplomatic corps was waiting for him at the airport to see him off. But on the way from the, his house to the airport, something happened and he was arrested and detained for one or two days. Uh, you see, what kind of government and of what kind of regime there is in, in Vietnam at the present time. But, as I said, he was saved by the fact that the diplomatic corps in Vietnam, that is the whole world, was watching. And therefore, after trying to kidnap him, the government had second thoughts, and he was allowed to go away. This is what I know. Yes, in the back. Would the ambassador comment on Pham Hui Ko as a candidate to succeed uh, President Ziem? Would the questioner identify himself, please? Mr. Zar of CNN Swiss paper. Mr. Zar of what is the paper again? See you in there, Swiss newspaper. I uh, only know that he is one of uh, those who outside Vietnam uh, wants uh, to uh, replace President Ngo Dinh Diem. Uh, he is one of uh, many, but I uh, do not know more about him. Yes, the young lady in the back. Has President Kennedy, Mr. McNamara, Dean Rust, and the others asked you for, was it his views on the Vietnamese? 
your views on the Vietnamese situation. I am uh, happy to hear that you are a representative of the Saturday Evening Post because I want uh, to congratulate the Saturday Evening Post for a very good article by Stanley Carnot, uh, The Crisis in Vietnam. And it is in the September 28th issue. I recommend this reading to you. As for the question, I prefer not to answer. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I share something of the same frustration Mr. Buttinger reflected in terms of some of the questions which have been asked of uh, visitors of this country, uh, who has suggested uh, that the critics of uh, the regime in Saigon are motivated in their criticism primarily by an altogether softer or different, more relaxed view toward communism than that shared by uh, uh, the Xi'an regime. Is it not true, Mr. Ambassador, that among the members of the faculty at the University of Hawaii who resigned in protest against the dismissal of Catholic rector of that university, and who resigned in protest against the repressive actions in Hawaii, which are almost beyond description, is it not true that a substantial number of these professors were themselves required, for fear of their own life, to leave communist North Vietnam and had, as a result of their own opposition to communism, fled to free Vietnam in order to continue the struggle against communism? Yes, certainly. And the Catholic rector of the university uh, is very much a Catholic. It is, uh, he is Father Kawan Luan, and he was dismissed by the government because he could not prevent his students from uh, supporting the Buddhist uh, revolt. And uh, I may say that in Vietnam or in the United States. Anyone who criticizes, who criticizes the government is immediately labeled communist-inspired or communist-oriented. Of course, some of them cannot be labeled that way. And uh, you have heard a spokesman or spokeswoman for the Ngoding family say a few weeks ago before coming to the United States. Of course, Ambassador Tran Van Tung is not a communist. I can guarantee you that he is not. But if his uh, words and statements are quoted and emphasized, it is because there is in the United States or in, uh, uh, in the West a, an international communist network. It, it has been recorded. I have recorded this statement. Therefore, beware not to be a an, an international communist network. And maybe you are communist <laughs> oriented to, because you have invited me. <laughs> yes, please. Will you tell us something about the Kung Lao Party with about 35,000 members? Or, or 70,000. <laughs> but nobody knows because it is a secret party, a, a, a secret society. 
uh, it is very clear indeed uh, that the Kan Lao Party is precisely the party which uh, is the party of Ngo Dinh Nhu, the real boss of Vietnam. And uh, it is strange that uh, a pro-government party has to be a kind of Francmasonry, a kind of secret society. And uh, this I, I, I know, but uh, I do not know uh, more about it. Or rather, I, I know that uh, this government has been kept uh, secret uh, because uh, it, uh, well, uh, there are many things that they do not uh, want people to know about their actions. I prefer not to, uh, to say names. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I, I prefer not to, uh, to qualify it, but I, I think that it is very much like uh, so, something like that. Are there any other questions? Yes, please. Would you identify yourself? Clifford uh, Evans asked two questions. One is, how is American aid being misused? And since apparently this has been going on for some time, how is it that you have resigned just recently and not some time ago? Indeed, I resigned five years ago. And I have a letter from President Ngo Dinh Diem refusing my resignation. And uh, then, why I have waited until the 22nd to resign firmly and in such a way that my resignation could no longer had to be accepted? It was because I am in Vietnam. I am the only Vietnamese to be able to speak to President Ngo Dinh Diem and to dare to speak to him. And I am very much a member of the family. And therefore, until the last moment, I had to weigh in what way I could be more useful to my people, to try to the last moment uh, to be of help to, to, to them. And that is why I, di I did not uh, consider resigning a year ago. A year ago, I only said to President Ngo Dinh Diem that the, I did not see any possibility under the present regime, any possibility of victory. And I asked him, himself, the chief of state, uh, to give up his absolute and arbitrary power uh, to another government. So that a total change of the government and the regime uh, be, uh, uh, be made an orderly change. But it was not, of course, it was quite equivalent to a resignation because an, uh, when an ambassador said to his uh, president, you should step, step down. You should change the whole uh, mess. You should change the whole, the, change totally the regime and the government. It is very much like a resignation, but it was not a resignation. Mm -hmm. 
Ah, uh, uh, the, the second question. Ah, very important. Because you said, uh, we want uh, to, uh, an example of misuse. Well, you, uh, I am I'm not betraying any secret. You, all of you here, have read in American newspaper the story of the so-called special forces. The special forces in Vietnam have been trained and paid for by American aid to bring war to North Vietnam. They have been even trained in assassination and, uh, assassinations and sabotage to do to the communists in North Vietnam what they are doing to us in South Vietnam. Well, all of you here know in what way they have been used, not against the communists, not in North Vietnam, but in Saigon and in Hue, to do such things as never happened in Vietnam before under any regime. They have been used to raid pagodas and to arrest, to round up like criminals, thousands of clergymen in a country which is predominantly Buddhist. And they have been used to arrest thousands of students, to close universities in, and schools in South Vietnam, in a country which has always had the greatest respect for education and learning, which has always had the greatest affection for its students. This is, I think, a flagrant case of misuse of American aid. And that is why now that cuts in aid are contemplated, I think that the first use of that power just given to the President of the United States be used against the Special Forces in Vietnam. The aid to those Special Forces should be cut just to know, to let the people of Vietnam know that you, the United States, you are not an accessory, an ex accessory to the crime of suppressing the Vietnamese people of suppressing the Buddhists, of suppressing the, the students, the educated youth of Vietnam. Before we turn to you, I'd like to put one question to the ambassador. Ambassador Lodge is reported to have uh, suggested to President Diem that uh, Mr. New and his wife should uh, uh, separate themselves, say, from the government, from the palace. You, on the other hand, have suggested that uh, President Zim himself should go. Now, uh, would the present position of the U.S., if it is as Ambassador Lodge is reported to have represented it, be sufficient? Or do you feel that, in fact, the President himself should also or must also go? Precisely, if I have delayed in resigning formally, it was because I had a dream. I dreamt of using President Ngo Dinh Diem as a way of uh, assuring an orderly change. Uh, but uh, he, until now, has stuck to his brother. And may I take the opportunity uh, of this question put to me about the two brothers to say that indeed uh, your reporters in Vietnam have made an understatement when they said that Ngo uh, Dinh Nhu, when they compared Ngo Dinh Nhu to, for instance, Mr. Robert Kennedy or uh, uh, to say that he, he is the head of the secret police. 
Well, it is an understatement, and it is most unfair to compare the Modin family to the Kennedy family. Because, because Modin knew is not the head of the secret police only. He, he is the head of everything in Vietnam. He is the head of the government. When he goes somewhere, the Vietnamese press or the official agency of Vietnam press in Vietnam say the presidential advisor has visited such place or such place. He was accompanied by the Secretary of the Interior or the Secretary of Finance and etc. He is indeed the head of the government. He is the head also of the National, Assemb National Assembly because and he, is, he has in Vietnam 10 times more power than President Kennedy himself has in the United States. He is the one who picks and chooses all the candidates to be elected to the National Assembly. And this is so true that recently, when Vietnam sent a delegation to the Belgrade Conference, the, the inter, inter parliamentary conference. Well, four, at least four or five members of the National Assembly went there and they stayed there for a month before the recent national elections. Do you think that Senator Keating, for instance, or any congressman in the United States could afford to uh, go abroad for a month before the elections and to stay away from the United States the day of the election and be sure to be re-elected? Re <laughs> and, and therefore, you see, the National Assembly of Vietnam is really a fake assembly. It is not a real assembly. It, is, it does not represent the people. It simply represents the Ngoding family. And it has been set up for the only purpose, for the purpose of uh, perpetuating the Ngo family in power. In case, for instance, President Ngoding Diem does not want to, uh, to, to be charged with nepotism. Therefore, he does not want his brother new uh, to be uh, vice president or to be president of the National Assembly. But he d does want him to succeed him if something happens to him. And therefore, the only way of doing this is to have the nas a National Assembly uh, handpicked so that if something happens to President Ngo Dinh Diem, the National Assembly, like one man, would say, oh no, we do not want the Vice President uh, to succeed the President. We do want Ngo Dinh Nhu to succeed the President. And that is why everything in Vietnam has been set up that way to perpetuate the Ngo family in power. And that is why the Vietnamese people are fed up with that regime of false democracy, even more so, even more than they were fed up with the regime of false independence in 53 and 54. And that is why, to, to end, I want to sound, sound a solemn warning, do not repeat the same error as in 19, as, as 10 years ago. The French at that time said, claimed, there is no alternative to us. They claimed that, uh, and the theory that claim was bought and bought dearly by the, the United States. And because you believe it, 10 years ago, North Vietnam was lost. 
Now, the Modin family have misused American aid to make a vacuum in Vietnam and to be, to say there is no alternative to us, to the Modin family. Beware, do not buy that claim because it would lead you to the loss of South Vietnam. I'll take the last question then from the young lady from the post. Is South Vietnam predominantly Buddhist or not? Uh, as Madame Liu has said, that it is not, but mostly Confucian. I thank you for the question, because it gives me an opportunity to clarify an important question. I heard the answer, and it has, uh, by the, the spokesman for the, or woman, for the Ngo family. And it said, the answer was this. It is untrue that the, the population of Vietnam is 75% Buddhist, because the president of the Buddhist Association in Vietnam, Mai Tho Thuyen, said himself that the Buddhist movement in Vietnam had only one million adherents. Well, I may say, that my wife, for instance, is very much a Buddhist. My mother is very much a Buddhist. And I myself is also a Buddhist. But we are not adher adherents uh, to uh, the, the organization of Mr. Mai Tho Chuyen. This is a sophism. Uh, and therefore, everyone in Vietnam knows that the majority of the population is very much Buddhist indeed. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. You have made a, a very great contribution to our, to our efforts here at the Overseas Press Club to bring all sides of all the major issues of the world to American public opinion through our club, and we are very grateful to you, sir. I, I thank you.